Look, you, you, you endeavor to meet the most interesting people in the world. I think that's something that most of us should try to go for. I endeavor to present to you those who not only do wonderful things, but every now and then, if you can get your hands on them, get to somebody who changed the game. It's a phrase that's overused, but in this case, bang on. This guy changed television by himself. Look at this. Every morning when he'd come to pick you up, I would look forward to it all night long in bed next to you. Those nights when you were actually in the bed. And then it all comes back. He talked to you all. Poor you. He made me feel like I met. That's... That's one of the most memorable scenes in The Sopranos, a show that has so many memorable scenes and so many memorable characters. The guy who created it is David Chase. That guy you saw in there, well, first of all, Carmel is amazing in that show, but Tony Soprano, James Gandolfini, well, David and James have teamed up again on a new project. It's called Not Fade Away. I encourage you to stick around and watch it. Here's the thing, you ever get that feeling like youth? Youth is going away, it's fleeting, and you long for those days of freedom when you felt like you could do anything, and then just have this maybe the greatest soundtrack of all time. Tie all of it in, and you've got this film not fade away that David made. Take a look at this. You're almost 21. A haircut is too much to ask, I'm sure, but you show up at that restaurant without a tie and a jacket, you and me gonna tangle, my friend. Please welcome to the show, David Chase! How are you, man? How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, congratulations, it's a hell of a film. Thank you. It's a really good film. I mean, it's a, it sounds crazy to say to a guy that made The Sopranos, but hey, you finally got to make your dream. I did. You got to make a movie. I got to make a movie. Because uh, this film, I, I heard it even talked a bit about that it's not an autobiographical picture, but there's clearly parts of your life that are in this film. So, I mean, I was in this half-assed band, and that's, we never we did anything except talk. Yeah. So, listen, <laughs> listen to records and then talk about them and, you know, try to learn some of the licks, but we never played for anybody. But that's all I was interested in. I, I was an English major in college, English literature, um, but I, I think I learned, or the real sustenance for me was probably some of that stuff, Dickens and all that, but was... Um, the next Stones album or the next Beatles album, that's all I could ever think of that. The idea of youth is also prominent in this. There's a kind of, the film in a way represented freedom. To me, uh, hope, all these things, trying to break out from your own scenario. Could you relate to that when you were growing up? I don't, I don't think I thought of it that way at the time. I, I mean, now that I think of the movie, the movie to me is partly about uh, this dichotomy that we human beings have, which is the desire for security and the desire for freedom. And those two things fight each other all the time. And like you know, like you want to be a member of a family and be taken care of and be accepted and loved and be you know, what do they say? It's like home is where when you knock on the door, they have to take you in. Yeah. At the same time, you don't want people limiting you or telling you what to think or what to say or defining you in any way. And those two things are always at odds. And it's hard to figure out how to get there. When did you figure out your rhythm, or have you figured out your rhythm? No, I have not. No, no. How's that working out for you? Not too well. No? Not too well. I mean, I, mean, I, um, I mean, I know a lot more than I did then, um, but I still have emotional roller coasters, you know? I, I suppose you, you know the moment you make a film, your first film, and you bring in James Gandolfini, there's going to be that thing. People go, oh, you guys are back together again. Yeah. The time in between the end of Sopranos and this, um, did you guys have a lot of contact? No, we did not. I had contact with other people from the show, but he and I didn't really have any contact at all. Just because? Um, I don't know. We both had enough of each other. He had enough of me, and uh, it was very difficult for him in the end. And I, it was just, we just had enough. The, 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 the end, the end? No, I mean, but the last, I think, the whole, the whole show is difficult for him because he's, he is not, <clears throat> I mean, the Tony Soprano must be part of his personality. There must be something there he can tap into. But he's also a very, uh, soft, kind of almost a hippie kind of a guy. And all the brutality and the cruelty, I think, the, the unending cruelty that show got to him. And he, he had to go to, the, to a dark place to get there. And he got tired of doing it. So you make the call and say, hey, I got this movie. And he's like, sure, no problem? No, no, no. He, no I, he sa I said, would you be interested in doing it? And he said, well, of course, I have to read it. And he read it and he said, are you sure you want to do this with me? I, didn't, I never thought you'd want to work with me again, number one. 
And number two, uh, are you sure that this isn't too early for us to be working together? I mean, or is this going to be good for the movie, for both of us to be associated with this? People will pick on that. People will find a problem with it. What was the effect on you having to constantly go to that dark place and, 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 and take the show that had so much attention and constantly work that? I had a blast. I, don't know. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Yeah. I used to love writing those characters. I used to just really enjoy it. They used to make me laugh. The thing about writing The Sopranos was, and it, um, most every line of dialogue you wrote <clears throat> was the truth was opposite. When Tony Soprano said anything, he usually meant just the reverse. Right. Uh, if Paulie Walnut said something, he meant just the reverse. They're always lying to each other, always deluding themselves and each other. And just writing that way was fun. It was fun because you know it was. You know it was. Bullshit, right. You know, <laughs> and to see people convincing themselves that their bullshit is uh, real. Here's a moment from when little Stephen was on our program. Stephen Van Zandt. Give me some closure on the Sopranos. Did Tony get whacked at the end? I mean, what? we just we need like this. Just you know, go what the what? Well, what I tell everybody is this. Good night. What are you tell? Yeah. You ready, George? Yeah. Just between me and you. Yeah. <laughs> at the end. The director said, cut, and the actors went home. <laughs> as much as I'm sure you're sick and tired of talking about the end of the show, but it's a thing. It's a part of the conversation. Yeah, it is. How do you feel about that? Um, how do I feel that it's a part of the conversation? Yeah. I'm glad that people remember it. I'm glad that it had an impact. Um, some people hated it, which we knew would happen. Um, I think over time, more people have come to, from what I understand when I read things online, most people have come to say, yeah, I get it now. I, I think it was the perfect ending for that show. Um, I'm flattered, I guess would be the word, that people still discuss, and, and amazed that people still discuss it and can get hot, get hot about it. So great to see you, man. Thank, congratulations on the film. It's a really good film. Thank you. Anyway. Thanks a lot. Pleasure to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Not Fade Away, December 28th in Toronto. Select City's January the 4th. We'll be right back. That's it. That's it. That's it.